Oh, hello. Welcome once again to Speakeasy with Paul F. Tompkins. I am still Paul F. Tompkins, and my guest this time out is a comedian who is on the rise, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, please say hello to Cameron Esposito. Cameron, hello. Hey, Cheers. Paul, how are Thank you? you for being here. Nice to see mm. you. Mm. Nice to see you as well. It's a great soda water, which is what I ordered. It's a refreshing soda water. Yeah. It's, look, we're this is early in the day that we're recording this. Absolutely it is. I don't want people making comments hey. like, blah, 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 blah. you know what I mean? Comments like that. We don't live that Hollywood lifestyle you think we live. Yes. We're in a, an abandoned house right now, <laughs> drinking that's, soda water. That's right. This is our life. This is Hollywood, baby. Yeah. Sometimes, remember when we used to go down to the dump? Yeah. And we would drink champagne. Just get a can. Put can the, of champagne. A can of champagne. Oh, I love a can of champagne. Pop the cork on the can. That's right, cork can. With a cork can, a can cork opener. <laughs> Those are tough. You got to get the ones that protect your fingers. It's true. You have had quite a couple of years. You moved to Los Angeles in 2012. Yeah, just two years ago. From Chicago. I did, yeah. You started stand-up there. How long had you been doing stand-up before you moved to Los Angeles? Six years in Chicago, and then I lived in Boston before that, so I started doing improv like when I was 19. So, improv in Boston? Uh-huh, yep. You were in a group that at one point, before you, I believe Amy Poehler had been in that group. Yeah, my college improv group. That what I is the name of that group? It is called My Mother's Fleabag. We're the oldest collegiate improv group in the country. Is that That's so? That's totally true, yeah. Really? Yeah, it's like the first one. It's been around for, well, I think when I was there, it was like 25 years, and then mm -hmm. that was like 40 years ago, so 65 years. Wow. I'm just used, super youthful looking, because I'm a lesbian. You know how that works, <laughs> that time travel sure. device. Absolutely. Uh, but yeah, Amy was in there 10 years ahead of me, so mm -hmm. I never knew her, but while I was studying improv in college, I was like, oh, this is how you get on Saturday Night Live, you just like be a banana in the cafeteria three nights a week or whatever suggestions they Walk were offering. Walk me through this banana skin. <laughs> <laughs> have, you, have you seen college improv? You know what? I never have. Oh, you have I've heard stories of it, I've never tons seen. Tons of jokes about dildos. Tons of other jokes about dildos. Is it that much different than post collegiate improv? No, you're right. It's the same. Yeah, it's the same. Uh, yeah. So that's that's what I, that's how I started. When did you get involved in uh, the circus? Oh, thanks. <laughs> Great question. So I was living in Chicago, and one thing that's magical about Chicago is mm -hmm. there's no entertainment industry in terms of like television and film. So people right. that are in the arts just kind of know each other because it's this massive DIY scene where yes, there's a lot of overlap. There's a huge arts community. Obviously, improv is huge there. Tons improv, of stand-up. Stand-up, but there's also like modern dance and mm -hmm. like noise rock. You know, there's like mm -hmm. just every, and everybody's producing their own things. And so there's a lot of creativity going on. And so I have some friends that are professional circus performers. That's what they do for a living. Mm -hmm. And they were in between contracts with like you know, major circus companies like Cirque du Soleil or whatever, and they were in Chicago, and they were forming their own circus to tour the country and also to stay in Chicago so they could work on their acts, mm -hmm. and they were looking for a ringmaster. And Paul, if you're anything like me, and I know you are, when you find out your friends are looking for a ringmaster, you go ahead and toss your top hat in that ring. That's right. Yeah. So they, they said, you know, they, they were like, hey, would you ever consider it? I said, why are you asking this question? This is ridiculous. Anything that you'd ever been interested yeah. in before in your life. Out the window, no. Uh, I mean, is this like when you're a little girl? Or did I ever you... think about being in the circus? Yeah, yeah. No, but I will say that I think for my poor parents, you know, like I, I was in grad school getting my master's in social work when I came to them and I said, I would like to actually instead be a stand-up comic. So I'm gonna go get my social work master's. Right. Uh, and then like this was a year later when I was like, just in case you guys were worried before, I've joined the circus. Yeah, you know, you know just the upping that ante. You know how you were clinging to the idea that I was going to be poor but doing a noble thing. <laughs> <laughs> nope, this is my glitter makeup. I did wear so much glitter makeup. That's one thing that's great. You about got a sparkle for the back row. Yeah, and circus gals know how to put all sorts of makeup on your face, sure. and they know how to make you little costumes that you can run around in, and mm. they have no body shame, so they're nude all the time, and that's not a bad thing because they're acrobats. They got amazing bodies. Do you still have any of your costumes? I do. I moved here with them. Right. You know, I was just like, oh, I'll bring, you know, this into the mix whenever I need all these circus ringmaster jackets. When did stand up happen? It was kind of, I was doing stand up when I was in Chicago and then I was a ringmaster when I was touring around. Um, but really what happened was that I moved 
to Chicago to get more improv training and then immediately realized that I hated improvisational comedy mm -hmm. for myself mm -hmm. as a career. Other people should keep well, doing it, but, but I that, just didn't like it. That is that is a thing because they are adjacent to each other, but they're very different disciplines. Yes. One of the benefits of, of improv is if you really like um, working with other people, if you like that give and take, if you like the the complete spontaneity of it, although of course with anything, spontaneity can be faked, but I think that <laughs> good improv is, you know, right. people who know what they're doing, it's 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 spontaneous every time. But you, you do give up a certain amount of control. So I was also kind of coming out during mm -hmm. this time. Um, and kind of when you were 20? So that was, I started coming out when I was 20, mm -hmm. like came out to a couple people. Right. Um, but it was, I was from a conservative Catholic family. Like it, I mean, it took me until I was on stage doing stand up when I was around 25 to really be talking about it openly. Mm -hmm. Like all the time, I was just kind of like peppering it into really close relationships, but then, you know, publicly, I guess, not super out. Because mm -hmm. how do you be out publicly unless you're an out stand up comic? You right. know, you're not gonna like order lesbian bagels. Unless you order lesbian bagels. I just mean like it's hard to I haven't spent work it in, in <laughs> it's hard to work it in or out of the conversation. You know? How do right. you just how do you just drop it into a normal convo? Well do you mean with are you talking with strangers or with people that you I mean to strangers, me it seems just like all the time. I mean yeah. you just live your whole life and people have this assumption yeah. that you're a straight person. And at the time I had two long sides of hair, so mm -hmm. it was even more confusing. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> Well, it's impossible. <laughs> yeah, how could you both her hair is the same length, it's symmetrical. <laughs> so I I think but this all relates to improv in that, you know, you have to agree with other people's statements and other people's ideas. And at the time I was learning that I really disagreed a lot with a lot of things that people were saying about gay people, both on stage Absolutely. and off. And Absolutely. so I would be in a scene and somebody would be like, you know, yes, and you should have sex with me. You know, mm -hmm. and you're supposed to be like, yes, and I will. And uh, I didn't want to, I just didn't want to be I didn't want to be a straight girl in all the scenes, and I also didn't want to be like a gay penguin. Because that's the mm -hmm. other thing, is that when you're just being a character, then people, if they know you're gay, will be like, Well, that's oh, but, the whole character. Yeah. yeah. So um, stand-up just became this place where I could talk honestly about my life, mm -hmm. and it was my own voice and my own thoughts. Yeah. You moved here in 2012. That's right. How long after that did you do that spot on Craig Ferguson? I think it was a year to the day, mm -hmm. maybe, that I moved here? Because I say it on the spot. Yeah. Um, yes, mm -hmm. wild. And the whole time in there, just trying to figure out like, what is television? Who controls it? Like, just like, not sure at all what to do. And then that I got that um, call the night before. Was that your first spot on national television? It was my television? first time on national television, yeah. yeah. And uh, if, if you haven't seen the clip, it is definitely worth your time. Um, you are, you're doing your set and it's going very well. And then in the course of your set, not on the couch, you start talking to Craig Ferguson and the guest was Jay Leno that night. Yes. Um, and, uh, and that's not something that you see every day on shows like that. Super bizarre stars aligning moment because Jay was on the show to talk about leaving his show. Yeah. So I mean, normally why would two hosts ever be on- Please! The yeah! Why would two hosts ever be on the same show? Mm -hmm. uh, but that's and, why. And different networks as yeah, well. Yeah, two, like across, yeah. like a Jetsons and Flintstones sort of a situation. <laughs> that's exactly right. Uh, and yeah, they just happened to both be there. But Jay was backstage, you know, in the green room area. And that dude, he could be in his own dressing room. Mm -hmm. He doesn't have to be like walking around, eating <laughs> the cheeses that I was eating. But he was. And I was pacing, looking at my notes, and so he just came up to me and said, you must be the stand-up on the show, because I can just like vibe out your stress sweat, and also you're looking at a tiny notebook. Right. Um, and yeah, so we had a conversation. He asked me if it was my first spot doing, uh, doing stand-up on television. I said it was my first spot doing stand-up on television. And he was like, you should just put away your notes. You totally know it. Don't worry about it. So Jay Leno's giving me advice. Mm -hmm. Wearing an all denim outfit at the time. Oh, was he? Yeah, he was, because he changed oh, to go on the oh. show. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> it was great. I mean, did that, what do you think led to you having the, um, I don't know if I would just say confidence, but the, the, uh, the, the comfort level 
to start talking to them in that way. Because the instinct would be, do your thing, deliver it to the camera, you know, and get out of this unscathed, yeah. you know. I think I have the opposite instincts for most comics. <laughs> it could be the improv background. Mm -hmm. Like when I started doing stand-up, it was really hard for me to have tight, honed material because yeah. I was just comfortable being on stage. Yeah, yeah. So I was just like, this is about just being on stage telling long stories, right? <laughs> With zero points in the middle, yeah. just no laughing, just a long one. Uh, so I'm, I was like kind of the right, the right comic for the job, mm -hmm. you know, because I had mentioned that Jay was wearing denim. Yeah. Which, as a lesbian, I love. That's like the line that I said. Right. And then uh, Craig asked me if I was calling Jay a lesbian. I don't know if it was just the fact that I had met them right before, mm -hmm. or that you live out here and you just kind of realize everybody's a person. Mm -hmm. They're just human beings. I mean, I felt like one thing that was funny was after this all happened, people wrote about this late mm -hmm. night set, which is super weird. Nobody would ever write about a late night set because what would you do, like summarize jokes? Yeah, but in this case, yeah, so, because this well, moment this was happened, remarkable. Yes, but yeah, the yeah. headlines were all like Jay Leno heckles Cameron Esposito <laughs> or like Jay Leno heckles first, and I didn't see it as heckling at all. No, it's not because it's like a loving moment. Yeah, and then they called me over to the couch because they knew that there was no way, there's nothing that I was gonna do in my set mm -hmm. that was going to eclipse this conversational moment with these two late night hosts, all yeah. of us joking together. Like there's no, no comic could achieve that. Uh, yeah. So they like brought me over to just kind of have a moment and see if we could get any laugh beats mm -hmm. talking. And mm -hmm. we did, we had like some great banter. Absolutely. Like real comics. With Ask a Lesbian, uh, you are answering questions that I'm sure a lot of these questions are questions you've been asked throughout your life. Yes. And have there been ones that have surprised you? Have there been a few that's like, I've never heard that question. Actually, before. no. Well, there was one. <laughs> Wait, no, there, there was one. Somebody asked me if it was easier for me to be a stripper. I don't know what they meant by that. I don't know if they were personally asking me. I've never done that job. Seems very difficult for anybody. Because I'm sure there are some questions that people don't realize that they're being condescending or insulting, sure. but they accidentally are. Sure. Um, are there questions that you get that people, you you can sense that, oh my God, this person really does mean well and just does not know? Because there's, yeah. because there are, there are ways to ask questions and there's, if that, uh, of somebody who has an experience that's different than yours, and then there are ways that, if you thought about that question for two more seconds, maybe you wouldn't have asked it. You know, I wonder if people would even be able to figure this out. Here's my, here's my question that, the question I think falls under this the most is, why do some lesbians look like men? Mm -hmm. Or why do lesbians date women that look like men if they're into women? Mm -hmm. And that question, I feel like even if you fed that back to that person that asked it, I'm not sure they would be able to decode what's strange about that. Mm -hmm. But I can answer it right now. What's strange about that is that we lesbian women do not look like men. They just have short haircuts and vests on. Yeah. So you have taken a clothing item and you've gendered it mm -hmm. and that's in your own mind. And this person is just wearing something that feels comfortable to them and powerful to them and short hair, nobody owns short hair. I mean, there are at least two to three basketball players that play in the NBA that have long hair. Right. So, I mean, I just think it's kind of like that. Your album? Same sex symbol. Do yeah. you have a copy of it? Yeah, I brought you one, oh. Paul, because I brought you this, this one because it's so big. Because it's a vinyl. Look at, check it's it out though. Huge. Wait, look, it's pink, just like a girl would have. Right. But you you did print a blue one for boys, right? Yeah, yeah. There's a blue okay. one for boys. <laughs> don't get stressed. Well, it's pink and there's white and it's marbled, so like you don't have to feel too stressed. But it's also like Beautiful. the kind of pink where it's kind of punk rock. Like it's less woman, more just like. You know, Do you know what it reminds board. me of, if I may? It reminds me of a squashed bowling ball. Yeah, that's exactly what I was going for, like eight yeah. pounder. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely an eight pounder. But you should, uh, you can you know, you can have this at your house, frame Thank it. Thank you very much. And well, that's what I'll do. Yeah. I do not have a turntable. <laughs> I'm a modern man. I live in modern times. Uh, same sex. <laughs> yeah, just mess. take the whole thing out. Same sex symbol. You are uh, currently touring in support mm -hmm. of this album. Yes. Um, and uh, how's the tour been? We're lucky to get you today. It's been great. Lots of, uh, lots more butt grabbing than in the past. I've had to put a table. I'm not kidding. Women are grabbing my butt. 
That's something that's happening on this tour specifically. Well, now, is that okay? No, I'm not super into it. You're an engaged lady. Yeah, you have I a fiance. I don't feel great about it. Yeah. How's the fiance? So I guess I'll, I'll just say, don't know about the camera. This? Do, please don't grab my butt. Don't. Hey. Yeah. Hands off. Please don't grab it. She knows about it. She's seen it. We yeah. came up with a plan she's together. Seen... Well, because she right. opens for me on the road because yeah. she's also a hilarious stand up comic, mm -hmm. Rhea Butcher, my fiance. Rhea Butcher. And, we're, and she used to open for me before we were dating, and then we were dating, and then it's now it's perfect because mm -hmm. she gets to open for me and we're engaged. Mm -hmm. It's awesome, but we have to stand on one side of a table because too many women were grabbing my rear end. That is totally true. What? Can you believe what? it? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Look. Regular rules of human conduct apply. Yes, all the time for everyone. But do you find that that's also a thing? If you if you talk about your life in stand-up comedy, yes, people feel there's a presumed intimacy. I think because my material is so personal, you know, yeah. it's way less observational. It's yeah, way yeah, yeah. more personal. I think people feel like they know me, and I totally get that. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember the first time that I went to see stand-up comedy live. I went to go see Margaret Cho. Mm -hmm. I was like in college. And I remember thinking before I went to the show, like, I wonder if I should bring a bottle of wine. Just in case afterwards I meet Margaret and she wants to hang out. And then what, I don't have anything? So this is not a plan <laughs> that I, I didn't buy the wine. Also, don't buy wine. Also, Margaret Cho doesn't want to hang out with me. She wants to go home to her hotel. She's have tired. Have you seen her since? She was at, so that taping, for my first uh, stand-up appearance, mm -hmm. she was a guest on an, on the prior show. Mm -hmm. So our dressing rooms were directly across from each other. And it, it felt like the most beautiful little mwah, like wrapping of that bow. That's a nice book ending. Yeah. Did Where you I was, have, did you I have did a bottle of wine? Oh, board. Cameron. <laughs> I should have brought it. Next time I didn't you'll know. She would All, be there. Always keep one in the yeah. car. Yeah, just keep your cho bottle. That's right. Always keep your cho bottle in the trunk. You don't know what's gonna happen. Uh, uh, so you're on tour now, uh, and you you did a you did a drunk history recently. I did a drunk history recently. I'm yeah. Excited to see that. I think it went well. I How was, would you know? I was texting I was texting Ria. I'm not drunk, but then what actually ended up she ended up receiving was no problem, Zed. So how'd Zed get in there? I don't know how Zed got in there. <laughs> yeah, it was alcohol. <laughs> uh. The album is Same Sex Symbol on Kill Rockstar's label. That is not a directive, it's just the name. Uh, Cameron Esposito, thank you very much for being here. Oh, a pleasure cheers. to chat with you always. Specific. Yes, indeed. That's it for this round of Speakeasy. Please join us again next time when my guest will be a different person. I have to put this all back. I know, I got it out. It was I oh, wait, there's a little thing in here. Yeah, there's a thing. Comment section. card. Oh, thank you section. Mm. Let's see if anyone here. No. Right? I, I don't know if you've had the experience where you're at a certain age where you look at something and your, your body says like, well, I think we've had enough, but your brain is like, no, never enough. Oh, I think everything. <laughs> yeah, everything so. I look at? Does that sound about yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm exhausted. Yeah. I'm exhausted. <laughs>